few weeks ago, I planned a new series called Relationship Goals. That was supposed to start last week and then again this week. <laughs> but last Sunday, sitting in the first experience, the Holy Spirit prompted my soul to talk about the subject of miracles. I believe that what God's been doing over these last five or six weeks, uh, there's a remnant of revival. There's this fresh anointing. There's this movement that God's doing. And so we're kind of in this vein of revival extended. And I don't know when it's going to end. We'll just wait on the Holy Spirit and we'll just keep preaching every week. And so I want to do a message today entitled Move. Move. This book is filled with miracle after miracle after miracle. Yet many scholars believe the exact number is difficult to determine because the argument is what constitutes a miracle. For example, is the ten plagues in Exodus one miracle or ten miracles? And so there's this, this argument, this battle between 150 to 164 miracles in God's Word. The Gospels in the New Testament record 37 miracles Jesus did himself, but the book of John says it only represents a small portion of the miracles Jesus performed during his ministry. And so we really don't know, do we, how many miracles are in this book. So let's take a poll. If you believe that God still performs miracles today, raise your hand. If you're watching online, raise that emoji hand. Let us know. I believe that we serve a God to whom all things are possible. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Philosophy and science says miracles are naturally impossible because the laws of nature cannot be violated. Therefore, the supernatural is superstitious and totally irrational. But if natural laws are governed by God, the one who spoke this world, the cosmos, into existence, then he has the authority to interrupt his laws if he so desires to do something supernatural. This is a Titleist Pro V1 golf ball. It's expensive. One dozen cost approximately $54. In other words, every time your husband hits one in the woods, so far he can't find it, or in the water, it cost him $4.50. Now, before you ladies start like, wow, okay, a color in a cut, like, no comparison, right? So, shh. Now, if I drop this ball, the law of gravity says it will fall to the floor. But what if I reach out and grab the ball midair? Did I break the law of gravity or did I interrupt the law of gravity? I believe every miracle in this book really, really happened. I believe God parted the Red Sea. I believe God made the sun stand still. I believe God made an axe head swim, did the backstroke. I believe Jesus turned water into wine, made the blind see, the deaf hear, and the lame walk. I believe Jesus raised the dead, including himself. Jesus is alive. He defeated death. It's why we show up, church. It's why we're in this room. It's why we got online. I know this lemon is sour because of my sense of taste, but I don't know how this lemon is sour, and I honestly don't need to know. Simply put, just because I don't know how God makes the impossible possible doesn't make it improbable. But this I do know, nothing removes the supernatural miracles of God like logic. Like the person who believes I am so smart that I know more than God himself. That I, the creation, know more than the creator. 
Do you realize that if you had all the knowledge possible, if you were the smartest person on the planet, at best you have 3% of all knowledge? Matthew 13 says, Jesus did not do many miracles in Nazareth because of their unbelief, because of their lack of faith. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. If we have to see it before we believe it, is it really faith? Now, I know some of you have prayed for God to do a miracle in someone's life, and maybe that life was your own life, and he didn't answer your prayer the way you prayed, so now your faith is unsettled, possibly shipwrecked. If that's you, I want you to clear your calendar and be back here next week because I'm going to talk about unanswered prayer. Was it a lack of my faith? Was it because I had doubt? But that's next week. This is this week. So grab your Bible or the Bible app on your mobile device and go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. The Bible says, sometime later. Talking about after Jesus' ministry in Galilee had ended, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews, talking about one of the three feasts the people of Jewish descent were required to attend. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. In Hebrew, it means the house of mercy, and it is surrounded by five covered colonnades, like a porch or a gazebo that protected the people from the elements of the weather. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, I've preached this text on several occasions, and maybe you've been here, and so it's not what you think. And every time I read this text, this scripture, I think to myself, no disrespect, Jesus, but your question to this disabled man seems kind of harsh. It it seems kind of insensitive. Jesus asked this man, do you want to get well? Now, if I am this disabled person, I am thinking, no, duh, Mr. Jesus. Of course I want to get well. Of course I want to walk and run like everyone else. On the surface, Jesus' question seems cruel and unusual, but we have to remember who is asking the question. It's Jesus, and he knows us better than we know us. He knows that anyone who has been confined to the same spot week after week, month after month, and year after year believes I am too weak to move on my own. When Jesus saw this man lying there, He knew he'd been in that condition for a long time. It's why Jesus asked him, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? PDV, Pastor Darrell version. He said, do you want to get well? Oh, come on, church. He's been disabled since 1986. Let's put it in our time period. When we only had four TV stations and rabbit ears. When the children were the remote control. Turn the station, boy. Put it on CBS. I need to watch hee-haw. Move the rabbit ears. I got some fuzz on my TV. Stand there. Don't move. Now we can stream endless movies and videos on this device. This man was disabled and in his mind unmovable for almost four decades. The people's identity at the pool of Bethesda was their infirmity. Their limitation was their label. Can I press in for a moment? Your primary identity is not your biggest failure or mistake. Your primary identity is not what you did, what you are doing, or what was done to you. And yes, I know some of you have endured some severe, disturbing abuse and heartbreak. Some people call it trauma. 
But trauma is not what happened to you. Trauma is the response to the emotional, mental, physical, sexual, or spiritual abuse that happened to you. Just because you can't see the wound doesn't mean it's not there or hurts just as much as a real open wound. When all you've known is substance abuse, when all you've known is anger, bitterness, betrayal, depression, divorce, guilt, panic attacks, shame, unforgiveness, sometimes you develop a a system of survival called a coping mechanism to deal with the pain, to deal with the hurt, the betrayal. You can create a narrative that you tell yourself to help you feel comfortable with what you think you cannot change. And yes, I understand what happened to you was real and it was wrong on so many levels and it explains why you are the way you are. But it never excuses the way you are because it becomes a crutch instead of being changed by the power of the gospel. If you need counseling, get counseling. May I suggest biblical counseling? Biblical counseling. But sooner or later, you have to sit at the feet of Jesus and let him fix your brokenness so you can walk in the fullness and the purpose of his life for you. Jesus never wastes words. He didn't ask this man, do you want to get well? Because he felt like chatting it up. Jesus knows the longer we stay in our disability, it becomes our new normal, allowing the enemy of darkness to convince us, this is who I am. This is my identity. So what happens? You don't want to get up. You don't want to get better. You don't want to get well. You become content in your disability. Be honest today. Do you prefer to be comforted in your criticism or changed? Do you prefer to be enabled in your addiction or experience freedom? Do you prefer to be disabled or delivered? For six weeks, church, we've been wrestling with Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out, reveal, expose anything in me that offends you, God. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. Come on, let's be real. Let's be honest. Let's take off the mask. All of us have issues. All of us have junk in the trunk. So get that judgmental look off your face because you ain't perfect. And yes, in Christ, you are a saint saved by God's amazing grace. But every person in this room has a disability. Some of them are beyond our control, like an accident, birth defect, or abuse. And some of them control our lives with addictions, bad habits, and strongholds. Bless God, I have both. (laughs) When I was born, my legs zigged and zagged in every direction but the right direction. Like a bad pretzel. (laughs) Over eight years, I had 11 surgeries and wore cast on my legs. For 51 years, I've worn leg braces and walked with crutches. When I was young, I encountered abuse on more than one level. And so I know what some of you are walking through or or have gone through. I've, I've struggled with anger my entire life. I don't like to lose at anything. Nothing. The motto, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, is how you play the game was written by a loser. I don't participate to get a trophy. No, I play to win the trophy. As a Christian, I've struggled in the past with pornography. I've wrestled with pride. Anger still rears its ugly head sometimes in traffic. Can I get a witness? Hitting that little white ball in the water. Good morning. My name is Daryl. It's 
Someone's in the room with me. I find it interesting. I've never seen this before. I find it interesting this group of disabled people had their own section. Kind of like some church people. Bitter people hang out over here. The critical people hang out with the critical people. The negative people hang out with the negative people. Why? Because misery loves company. But, and this is a really big but, it also creates a culture, and the truth is the culture is often worse than the disease. Because within the culture, the anger, the bitterness, the negativity thrives. Birds of a feather flock together to support their disability. Do you hang out with addicted people, angry people, bitter people, church shopping people, depressed people, fearful people, negative people, because it supports your disability, it supports your stronghold? I can still hear my pastor's voice. Daryl, Beller, no, it's Bellar, (laughs) Beller. The people you surround yourself with is who you will become. Have you noticed how people on social media live in their own echo chambers? They follow, retweet, share, and quote people who think and believe like they think. And then they post everything. They say, everybody's saying it. Everybody's saying it. Everybody believes like I believe. No. It's just you and your four followers. <laughs> friends and who are not really your friends. You know what chaps my John Brown hind parts? I'm, I'm just going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have a moment. Yeah. It's people who, who don't attend church but have all of the self-professed answers why the church is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's what I call armchair Christianity. Uh-huh. People who point the finger of condemnation and correction but never darken the doors of the church to be part of the solution. And if they do, they just sit on their blessed assurance. They go, they should do this or they should do that. Get up. Be a part of what God's doing. Get out of your section. Have a revival. (laughs) We live in a culture of Christianity that says, I love Christ, but I don't need the church. And that's a lie from the pits of hell. It's biblically incorrect. It's biblically illiterate and doctrinally demonic because you cannot have Jesus without the body. I need you. You need me. We need each other. When a body part is missing, the body never functions at full capacity. It's why the Bible says, do not give up meeting together as some people are in the habit of doing and I know I need to say this especially in our culture in our time I get it I know that church hurt is real but it's not a new thing it's not a new thing read the book the church people in Corinth were choosing who was the best spiritual leader some said it's Paul some said it's Peter others said no 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 it's Apollos but the super spiritual people Said, I only follow Jesus. Hashtag oversave, right? <laughs> the church in Corinth had some Jerry Springer stuff happening. Okay. For real. People blow my mind when they say the Bible's boring. That tells me you haven't picked it up. You haven't even opened it up. It's not boring. People were taking each other to court because they couldn't settle their disputes with each other. They argued over what kind of food they had to eat. Some people got drunk on communion. That's why we use grape juice. Someone will be down here going, keep going, Pastor Jeremy. I'm just worshiping my Lord. No, no, that, that's my juice. This one's my juice. No, oh, this is my juice. They fought over spiritual gifts and different views of the resurrection. And here's what Paul said about those believers. This is crazy. This is insane. He said, I always thank God for you. You have been enriched in every way. 
You do not lack any spiritual gift. God will keep you strong until the end. I read that and I think, I pray one day I can be like Brother Paul. <laughs> but I'm not there yet. I'm just going to tell you. When I encounter critical and negative people on social media, I have a block party. Like, I block you, I block you, I block you, I block you. You get a life sentence right here. You get a life sentence. <laughs> I don't have time for division or dissension. Because here's what I've discovered, church. Most people would rather be accepted and affirmed in their disability rather than be changed. Jesus did everything that you need to live the victorious Christian life. Your past doesn't have to define your future destiny. Well, well preacher, Pastor Darrell, alcoholism has always been part of our family. Anger has always been part of our family. Addiction has always been part of our family. Divorce has always been part of our family. Gambling has always been part of our family. Poverty has always been part of our family. It is what it is. My grandfather was an alcoholic. My dad was an alcoholic. I guess I'm an alcoholic. My grandma got a divorce. My mom got a divorce. I guess I'm, I'm just headed for divorce. Poverty has always ran through our family. It is what it is, but it doesn't have to stay that way. You can be the chain breaker that changes everything. Every generational curse was defeated, destroyed, and dethroned on the cross of Calvary. Galatians 3 says Jesus redeemed us from the curse. In other words, you can draw a bloodline in the sand from Emmanuel's veins and change future generations to come. You can change your future, your children's future, and your children's children's future if you will break the chain. It doesn't have to stay the same. You don't have to follow suit. The porch in our story is packed with people with all different kinds of disabilities. But why are they there, church? Why are they on these porches? What, what, what's the significance of this spot? In most translations, verse 4 is omitted. But I believe it's verse 4 that helps us understand why these people are gathered by the pool of Bethesda. John 5, 4, New King James Version. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. For 38 years, this man waited and waited and waited for someone to help, help him get into the pool. But it never happened because the religious system was jacked up. In this day, if you had a physical disability, it meant that you were spiritually sick and did not deserve God's healing. But Jesus steps onto the scene on the Sabbath, on the day of rest. I love Jesus. Yes, I do. <laughs> I love Jesus. How about you? And he says, that's BS. That's a broken system of rules and religion. But this man didn't know Jesus. His ministry is just getting started. Yeah. He hasn't even multiplied the boy's lunch from Captain D's yet. Wow. <laughs> so Jesus understands his excuses. Jesus understands his skepticism. Yeah. Because he's in a broken system that says if you don't keep the law, you can't be healed. Wow. But Jesus is about to break down some barriers because in Christ, you are not a filthy sinner. You are forgiven. You are not condemned. You have been cleansed. The broken system was covered by the blood of Jesus. The Bible says for the joy. Don't miss this church. For the joy. Jesus endured the cross to have a relationship with you. To have a relationship with me. To have a relationship with all of humanity for the joy he endured the cross wow. for the joy wow. 
The Bible says, while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. In other words, Jesus died knowing some would never love him back. Jesus died for our sins. Hallelujah. But he rose again for our freedom to set us free to live free, church. Yeah. This man was stuck in a system called religion. And he was trying so hard to get into the pool. But Jesus shows up and says, I want you to stop trying and start trusting. Yes, sir. Ooh, don't miss that. <laughs> stop trying and start trusting. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 1.7 says, in him we have redemption through his blood. Wow. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of what? God's grace. Our text says there's five covered colonnades. Do you know what the number five represents? Grace. Grace came to the pool of Bethesda. And here's what he told him to do to receive a miracle in verse 8, verse 9. He said, get up. I need you to move. I need your faith to be in action. Pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. Jesus asked this man one simple question. Do you want to get well? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Do you want to get well? I need your faith to be greater than the fear of your disability. His breakthrough was determined by whether or not his desire was bigger than his disability. Jesus is asking all of us the same question. Do you want to get well? Your condition doesn't have to be your conclusion. You don't have to walk out of here the same way you came in. How long have you been shackled to your stronghold of solitary confinement? Six months, one year, three years, five years? You will never have a breakthrough until your desire to move is bigger than your disability. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is hope in the name of Jesus. There is strength in the name of Jesus. There is healing in the name of Jesus. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. But nothing changes until you move. Until you move. I've learned three important lessons from failure. From failure. Number one, own it. Stop blaming other people. Stop throwing shade. Stop posting about them. Stop being a victim and walk in victory. As Christians, we fight from victory. Not for victory. Because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. Yes, Number two, in Christ, you don't fall from grace, you fall into grace. Grace is so much more than a doctrinal or, or theological concept. It's a person by the name of Jesus who will pull you out of the deepest, darkest valleys of life. The prodigal son lost everything but his father's love. Dad, I want my inheritance. And I want it now. And he gave it to him. And the Bible says he went out and wasted all of it on the things of this world. Do you realize the story of the prodigal son? We are the prodigal son. And the father is God. And so he loses everything. And he finds himself in the pig pen of life. And he said, I have to return home. And returning home required movement. And the Bible says he started for home. And the father was waiting like he had been doing day after day. Waiting for the return of his son. And the Bible says when he saw him from, uh, from afar off, he ran to him. He didn't chastise him. He didn't condemn him. 
The Bible says he threw his arms around him and he hugged him and he kissed him. He said, my son was lost, but now he's found. And he threw a party. Threw a party. The longer you deny or delay to get up from your disability, it will continue to control you. It will continue to own you. Do you know what the ingredients of a miracle is? It's a hopeless situation. And you have exhausted all other options. Is that you today? If you want a miracle, God needs more than your mouth. He needs movement. Number three, what I've learned from failure. God truly brings beauty from the ashes of our lives. Jesus told this disabled man to get up. I command you to move out of your condition. You don't have to leave here the same way you came in. Everything this man endured for 38 years culminated in this moment. I'm closing. I'm landing the plane. I need some intercessors. I need some deacons. I need some staff to come to this front and start praying right now. God is about to do something in someone's life. I don't know who you are. I don't even know where you're seated. I don't know if you're in this room or watching online. But I do know this. This is your moment where God steps into your addiction. Where God steps into your abuse. Where God steps into your anger. Where God steps into your brokenness, your depression, your disability, your disappointment, your excuses, your fear, your guilt, your generational curse. Your hopelessness, your insecurities, your loneliness, your negativity, your pain, your prodigal living, your sickness, your unforgiveness, your trauma, your weakness, and set you free in the name of Jesus. Lean in, church, closer. You, you can't change your family's past genealogy, but you can say to God from this day forward on October the 20th, 2024, Everything changes. Today, the addiction stops. Today, today, the abuse stops. Today, the divorce stops. Today, the gambling stops. Today, the pornography stops. Today, I'm choosing to pick up my mat and walk out of here healed and whole, set free, to live free in the name of Jesus. I want every person to stand to your feet. This is how I'm closing. For those of you who are struggling with something, you know what it is. God knows what it is. My challenge is for you to make this front and altar. Why? Because your miracle requires movement. Come on, who will be the first? God, I need freedom. God, I need forgiveness. God, I need victory. Come to this front, making an altar. Tell God today everything changes. Today I walk out of here in freedom. I walk out of here set free. God, I need you. I need you to move in my life. I need to break this generational curse. Our marriage needs you. My life needs you. If you're down here at the front, whether you're standing or on your knees, I want you to turn your hands over like this. Turn your hands over as a sign of surrender. And tell God, I surrender this area, whatever area it is, to you, God. I give you, Holy Spirit, control over my life. Control over this anger. Control over this bitterness. Control over this unforgiveness. God, I need healing. I need freedom. I don't need to leave here the same way I came in. Tell God my my desire is greater than my disability. Now I want everyone to repeat, repeat after me, whether you're down at the front or whether you're standing in your seat. I want everyone to say, in Christ I am accepted. Let's do it again. In Christ, I am accepted. I am adopted. I am anointed. I am blessed. 
I am called. I am a conqueror. I am delivered. I am forgiven. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I am loved. I am an overcomer. I am pardoned. I am saved. I am treasured. I am qualified. That's who you are in Christ. Don't let the enemy lie to you any longer. This is your moment. This is your time. What will you do with God? One of our leaders may come and pray over you. If you need someone to pray with you, grab them by the arm say, pray with me. If you need private prayer afterwards, you can go to our care room. Our deacons will be waiting on you. Don't leave this room. Let God work in your soul. Let the Holy Spirit move. Let God change you, transform you from the inside out. Come on, Pastor Jeremy.